my name is Nanashka De Souza, and um, I'm a third year student at the University of Toronto, and my major is Film Studies. My name's Zara, and I'm in my fourth year at the University of Toronto, I'm studying English. Living with um, mental health problems, especially attending U of T, has been extremely difficult, just because they put, they kind of expect all these things from us, but then they don't provide help when we ask for it or when we need it the most. And I think that's the biggest um, problem. When I was in middle school, I was officially diagnosed with depression as a result of bullying. Um, traumas at home, etc. Um, when I got older into high school, I developed an eating disorder that it's, I've been in recovery for it for about four or five years now, but it still follows me. And just recently, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder last December. So it's been an ongoing, just an ongoing, cycle of experience, experiencing different sort, different forms of mental illness, trying to figure out how to deal with them, how to handle day-to-day -day life. It all, I knew that something was extremely wrong when um, I was sitting in, this was second year of university, and I was sitting in abnormal psychology class, ironically, <laughs> and um, we were watching a video on the um, screen and I just kind of started breathing really quick and heavily and I just like I, it got to the point where I, I couldn't breathe and then I had to leave the lecture hall and when I went to the washroom I just completely lost it and it was I've, I've never kind of lost control of my emotions in that way and I, I was gasping for breath and I was crying and it was a complete mess. And I just thought like, I can't do this. Like, I, I, I can't go the way that I am going right now at U of T because this is just, this is too much. Um, in second year, I was a psychology major and the competition is fierce. And it was just, the pressure was getting to me because I knew that I wasn't as smart as all these other people and my grades were not as good. And I was taking six courses during the semester and that was probably the biggest mistake ever. Whenever I had to like come up with essays within three weeks or like study for five exams within a month, like, I'm pretty sure that's not possible. <laughs> so it kind of always was sitting at the back of my mind, like, oh, you have to do this, you have to do this. Plus I was commuting two hours every day because I come from Brampton all the way to the University of Toronto. So it was just a lot of things kind of sitting at the back of my mind. Most recently it's been difficult in January I attempted suicide and after that I skipped class a lot. It was too hard to leave bed and there were a number of my classes where attendance was such an important thing. You missed more than two classes, you lose 20% and when I was going through such a hard time, the thought of attending class was just unnecessary. It just felt extra when I'm struggling to just stay alive. I just recently got diagnosed with depression officially by a doctor. Before that, it was self-diagnosis, which a lot of us students have to do because it's not like the university is going to give us an appointment. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I've started taking pills and, I, I, and there's a stigma around taking medication for mental health and I don't think that there should be. I think that students should do what they have to do to get better because 
the University of Toronto is not going to do anything for you. My name is Michael Wilson, and I am the Chancellor of the University of Toronto. I've just completed my fourth year, but two more years to go. Our son became ill with a mental health problem, and it became a huge burden for him. The stigma, in particular, was a burden for him in that he said to me, don't ever tell people where I am, Dad. I, if they know that I'm in a mental health pro hospital, then I'll lose all my friends. I'll never be able to get a job again. So I saw the burden of stigma on him, and he ultimately took his own life. When I became the chancellor, one of the first questions that I asked was, what is happening on the university, at the University of Toronto on campus, uh, to support students who are having difficulties with their mental health. And I was quite impressed at, at that stage, which would have been four years ago, I think there were something like 80 different organizations on campus that uh, were supporting students who had mental health difficulties. These could be uh, organizations that were directly involved with the administration of the university, but also peer support programs, student programs, uh, uh, volunteer programs, uh, but something uh, that was quite broad when you looked at the overall picture. My name is Janine Robb. I'm the Executive Director of Health and Wellness at the University of Toronto at St. George Campus. I'm responsible for student-facing health services that are comprised of general practice, specialty services such as mental health. Um, we have specialized medical services as well and health promotion. So CAPS has been absorbed within an integrated health and wellness framework. Last year at this time, we were busily preparing to have an integrated service that was reflective of the kind of services students could receive in the community. The idea was to make sure that students had a general practitioner or a family doctor before they moved on to specialized services. The idea was to make the best clinical decision about the resources that the student would need at the time with the underlying idea that they're getting the right care at the right time with the right clinician in the right place. I think that's where I went wrong because I realized soon that there are people you have to kind of make your own kind of support group. you have to find people that you trust and it might not not necessarily be your parents and that's okay because there are people who care about you and your parents grew up in a different time and a different culture and they may not expect I mean accept mental health as being like a huge um, issue and that was one of the biggest things because coming from a South Asian family um, they don't think that depression exists. <laughs> I took a handful of pills and I just hoped that I would die. When I woke the next morning at 5 a.m. I just threw up all the pills and my family didn't find out. Nobody really found out unless I told them. And it was difficult because I didn't want the school to find out. I didn't want to say I can't attend class because this happened because I didn't want to get sent to the hospital. I didn't want to be an inpatient there. I just wanted them to understand, like, I'm going through a tough time. Just give me a break. Let me take time so I can become who I need to be. One of the biggest challenges of a university the size of the University of Toronto, which has 85,000 students on the three campuses, is to reach out and make sure that students don't fall between the cracks. And if people have difficulties with stress, with anxiety, with depression, that there are ways that they can get support. Uh, so this is the challenge. And the other big challenge is that uh, a student coming to the university, any university, will be leaving classrooms of 25 people in high school to much larger classrooms and therefore less contact with the, the teachers, with the professors. So that is a challenge that we have to deal with. Uh, I think that with those 82 different organizations, 
we're reaching out and trying to find ways that we can identify people who need support. Back in 2012-2013, there was a lot of media presence with concerns being expressed around student mental health on campuses. Um, there were some identified suicide rates, um, there were a lot of students who were feeling they weren't getting the resources and the supports that they needed on campus. And U of T undertook to develop a framework that tried to pull all of these issues and concerns together, to do an environmental scan, and to also um, hold uh, many student focus groups to make sure that we were going to be able to meet the needs of the students. Before I left politics, I made the decision that this was where I was going to devote my energies uh, for my not-for-profit activities. I could not think of one person who I knew who was a volunteer in the mental health field. They just thought that I was stressed out. And when I told them, I feel, this was before I was officially diagnosed, when I told them, oh, I feel kind of sad, more than more often than usual they said like oh what do you have to be sad about you have everything and it's it's more this thing of you should be happy because you're you have a roof over your head and the basic necessities of life and it's like okay <laughs> but i would like to also be happy and like be able to enjoy life um yeah i've experienced suicidal thoughts uh, three times in the past three years. And it always occurred <laughs> around exam time. And it was always kind of this thing where um, I don't want to be in this place and I'm never going to be good enough. But when I became aware of the stigma problem that he was uh, facing, I felt that this is something that was very important for me to speak out about because I saw directly how it affected him in his last days. Living with mental illness is something that I would not wish for my enemy. It's a constant fight, it's a constant suffering, it's a constant pain. And I started realizing that something was not right when I immediately came to Canada. I was born and raised in Kenya in a family of five siblings and four cousins. And I was, I'm the eldest in the family. And for that, I was always protecting my younger siblings. Uh, my name is Holly Luckman. I'm the Interim Director here at the Centre for International Experience. The Centre for International Experience provides a number of different supports for degree-seeking international students, as well as uh, visiting international students such as Student Exchange and other scholars are coming to our university campus. And so here at the university, it's 16,000 plus international students. And again, not to say that every international student has the same experience, but what I hear from international students is that there can be a lot of pressure to succeed to get your university degree in four years. And so when that pressure is there, when things become more of a challenge, um, how do we encourage international students from early on putting some time aside for helping them develop those resiliency, for helping them realize that it's important also to take time out for oneself. In my family, I had to be the best. I had to be perfect. I had to hold the flag high for the people of my community, for the people of my society and my country. I've dealt with suicidal thoughts over the course of my life. A lot of it just comes from my own background, where I come from a family where everything's planned out for me. I have to live according to a certain way. And knowing that I am not that person that if I want to do what I want to do, I will be pushed away and lose everything. That was very, it was always in the back of my head. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying and I would be irritable and I would kind of not talk to my friends for days and I would just lash out at my parents. 
when they ask me what's wrong, or, are you okay, and stuff like that. And I kind of just had this overall feeling that like no one cared about me. When I started experiencing a sense of loss, I did not know what to do because I was constantly reminding myself that no, no, I'm not a failure. I need to be the best. I needed to be Oprah. I needed to be Nelson Mandela. I needed to be Malala. Because those are powerful people that I admire so much. I needed to be Shonda Rhimes and write all the kind of stories for the television. But in between my dreams and the reality, I fall into depression that led me into a place that was very dark, into a place of suffering, into a place of loneliness and isolation. I started seeking help from the university uh, in December or October of last year. And what I found was that they make the process really difficult. So first of all, the website is extremely hard to navigate because I'm pretty sure they merged everything together. So what you need is a form to get an appointment and then you have to wait for them to um, give you an appointment. So first of all, I couldn't find the form anywhere on the website. So when I called them saying that my doctor referred me to you guys to um, get some psychological help, they said, oh, you need to fill out the form, but there's no form. <laughs> um, Three years into the university, I was struggling with school, with friendships, with everything that I've, I've always wanted to be, with everything that I loved. I loved singing. Singing disappeared. I loved writing poetry. Poetry disappeared. All those things that I loved. And I look back at that young, beautiful girl who loved to sing, who loved to do poetry, who loved to dance. It all vanished, and I didn't know what to do. And the day I say, I need help. I walked myself into health and wellness at the University of Toronto and said, I need help. As you know, U of T on the St. George campus is very big. We have 60,000 students, and I'm not even sure how many staff and faculty we have. But we have been actively over the last year and a half going out and doing presentations on how to identify, assist, and refer students in distress. So giving faculty and staff sort of a, a, a toolkit to sort of identify changes in students' behavior, and then have the language to say, how can I help you? Is there something you need? I told my mother, she, she had the similar reaction that she would have before when I would tell her if something was wrong. Sometimes people who love you want to help, but they don't know how to help you, what to say. And sometimes it's just best to keep things to yourself. So I just kind of lost hope with that. Like I called them maybe three times about that whole form situation and every time they were extremely dismissive and they just it seemed like they had enough on their plate and i felt like i was kind of a burden on their whole system so i just kind of left that and i thought i'm just going to go to my doctor and get help from my doctor the university offers a number of different resources but i find that there's a lot of difficulties or issues with a lot of them there's a lot of issues with for example, when I go to the health and counseling center, there's, it's like a process that everyone has to follow and then boom, they'll be okay. Go see a counselor, get, go see a doctor, get a prescription for some medication, keep seeing the counselor, get registered with accessibility, and now you should be able to attend all your classes. 
do well in all your classes, and that's just not the reality of things. I have a very difficult time. I experience a lot of paranoia as a result of my borderline personality disorder, and I don't feel comfortable telling just telling a therapist or a counselor like every single thing that's going on in my life. It terrifies me knowing that someone's just sitting there getting paid to listen to what I have to say. What, what really helps me is just talking with like a couple of professors that I'm comfortable with that I talk to after, after class and stuff because I know that they, I'm not just a number in their class, they genuinely care about me as a person. Well, this is a difficult uh, scenario for professors, I think, particularly in the large classes in uh, identifying students that might be in crisis. Uh, you know, mental health, I think, has still got a lot of stigma to it. Uh, uh, students don't often self-identify as having those issues, so uh, professors can be quite unaware of uh, a student's particular circumstance. Sometimes when students do very badly in the course, uh, I try to reach out to them. I do send emails. Um, offer uh, an opportunity to come and talk to me about their status but once again I find very few students take that opportunity to do so unfortunately. The professors don't care about us. <laughs> um, they, I'm pretty sure they're only uh, concerned about their position as a professor at the University of Toronto and also um, whether their courses are being, uh, I don't know, taken by enough students. Uh, they, don't, they don't really care about individual students' well-being or anything like that. So my name is Kara Young. I go to the University of Toronto Scarborough and I study psychology and health studies. Well, both in terms of personal experiences and in terms of statistics. So I sought um, mental health help for about a year and a half in my second, third year, and actually right now I'm starting to seek help again. So My Spider Magazine means building a sustainable community of those around um, students in particular, and that we basically focus on the community around the students. So friends, family, staff members, alumni even, to really tap into everyone's ideas and insights into how we could problem solve. It really comes down to problem solving. We're not trying to be heroes, we're not trying to romanticize any notions of mental illnesses or even the experience of ex thinking that we experience something like a mental illness or a disorder. I think my biggest support system would have to be myself. I feel like it's a strange thing to say, but I've learned over the course of the past few months, few years, that I, when I rely on friends, when I rely on family, still, it's hard to rely on people because people always won't always be there for you. And sometimes you just need someone who's always going to be there for you and that's, it's you. You're always going to be there for yourself. So it's hard, but just working on loving myself and just always trying to make sure that everything's going okay with myself. In part, I would say that it has to begin at the very um, beginning when students arrive to our campus. And we, you're, the fact that students are um, thinking about mental health in very different uh, positions and uh, places from the world. And so a student that may be fearful about a, a mental health diagnosis or a student that's not quite aware of how confidentiality works and so we have to have different messaging to reach those students and part so that they can understand that the way that they think about mental health is really a cultural position and as well as we have to introduce them to the university's way that they think about mental health and so a very important part of the university's campaign has been around um, re building resiliency. Um, there are maybe one or two that I didn't reach out to them because I just think that that's kind of inappropriate. Um, I feel like when you're building a relationship with the with a professor, it should be strictly um, academic. Uh, so they kind of weren't exactly approachable about these things. 
is that sometimes, again, confidentiality can be a unique factor. And so students um, sometimes are concerned about what happens if I disclose a mental health issue. Um, sometimes students don't think that the university is a place to disclose that, that that's something that's personal, that you may only talk to the family member. And so it's really important that we introduce the university culture around this so that students realize that this is, for many students, this is a normal part of their age group of going up, of being a young adult, um, and that the university is a place that it can be a partnership for. Uh, Cameron was um, uh, quite an outgoing boy. He uh, had um, uh, a lot of friends, but he did not want them to know about his illness. And what was really sad for me is at his funeral, a lot of his friends came to the funeral and said, if I'd only known that Cameron was suffering from depression, that I would have been very happy to help. So that's what he cut himself off from. U of T's mental strategy had one student, representing over 60,000 undergraduate students, to inform their mental health strategy. What are the different structural barriers that promote students getting sicker, that are evidently problematic for a student to even have access to the education, never mind thrive, but to be able to afford the education in the first place? If it's an academic issue, there are a lot of health resources students can access for that. And if it uh, relates to uh, some kind of personal issues, I'm not a counselor, I'm not the best one perhaps to deal with that, but the Health and Wellness Center at the Copper Student Center is where I would uh, definitely refer students. My name is Teodora Pasca. Uh, I'm a third year criminology and ethics study law student at U of T. And at the varsity, I'm the comment editor. My name is Shaheen Amtiaz. I just finished my second year at the University of Toronto. I study computer science here, and I am the Vice President Campus Life at the University of Toronto Students Union. The state of mental health right now, I think, depends on each individual person's perspective. Um, from my own personal experience, like my own mental health and like the way that the resources on campus have helped, it has been significant, but I know that a lot of them don't reach every student. Um, but I definitely think it's incredibly important and it's not given sometimes the exposure that it should be given. When I hear mental health, what comes into my mind is all those times when I was too busy to sleep or eat, all those times when I had to wait for months to you know, even get an appointment to even talk to someone. And what also comes to mind is, is all, are all the resources that are at my disposal but that I may not already know about. I only found these services in third year when I actively started seeking them out. And I think the thing is with the University of Toronto that they don't show you, they don't tell you that they have these services. It's only kind of like, oh, by the way, we have them if you need them. But I also think there's this other element of like fearing coming forward, even if there is a resource offered to you, um, where people don't feel comfortable doing that. So that resource is not taken advantage of, which is unfortunate on both sides. It is a really long wait list though. I tried in September to become, to get with accessibility services and it didn't, I wasn't accepted for about a month because I was on the wait list for that long. I've heard, obviously I've heard stories of very long wait times at clinics and things like that, where it's like the resources have definitely been lacking. Um, but I also think there's this other element of like fearing coming forward, even if there is a resource offered to you, um, where people don't feel comfortable doing that. So that resource is not taken advantage of, which is unfortunate on both sides. Wait lists come up everywhere and you have to realize that in care, whether it's here in the university or out in the community, there is going to be periods of time when you're waiting. We've spent a lot of time through the integration of our service, through the development of group programming, development of workshops and development of specialized um, 
evidence-based treatments to uh, create a continuum of care. It's really good that accessibility services are there, but it's not so accessible when it takes so long to become a part of it. Well, it's, it's really, as my boss would say, the anarchy of the anecdote and that it's sort of part of the student's institutional history, which is they never get what they need when they want it. <laughs> and we have tried very hard to put in a continuum of resources that can be accessed at any time to support them as they're feeling maybe emotionally uncertain or dysregulated. The University of Toronto is one of the most diverse campuses in Canada. International students sometimes come with uh, whole cultural uh, issues that they have to face in a new country, in a new educational system. They struggle a bit with that. It's difficult to speak about international students because in such a thing that this is a very diverse cohort. And so when we speak about international students, it's kind of difficult to know exactly what does one mean. Do we mean persons that pay international student fees? Do we mean persons that um, have been nurtured uh, their educational system has been outside of Canada? Does it mean the international students that have had high school, significant high school here in Canada? Um, and then also when you're looking at where all these students are coming from, that they have very different and diverse needs. And so that's the first thing is, is that, that there is no, we want to challenge the notion of who the international student is. to Canada I experienced a lot of loneliness, a lot of things that I don't even want to say. And with time I started feeling so depressed. A sense of being lost started coming in. Um, and then along the way it's just the early transition. It's really important for us to understand all the different transitional challenges that an international student will face. And so what does it mean to leave your home country, um, leave your friends and family, and make this incredible journey to the University of Toronto? And, and that can be sometimes a very challenging thing. I came here with the idea that I want to be the best. I want to be Nelson Mandela. I want to be Malala. I want to be Oprah. But it didn't happen. Also, I believe. Because every time I want to reach that goal, there was a sense of lostness in me. I was lost in school, in friendships, in everything. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I took a handful of pills and just, I just wanted the pain to be over. I didn't think life was worth living. And in that moment, I didn't have a future anymore. What I did to come out of it was always tell myself, like, you have parents that love you, you have friends that care about you, you have so much of the world to still see. <laughs> so suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And that's what I always tell myself. Definitely, there is a lot of stigma surrounding mental health. Um, for example, one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto Student Union is, is, is intending to run a campaign um, surrounding like uh, mental health and disabilities and such, and the stigma that surrounds it, even like having conversations about it and treating it as like a part of your day-to-day -day life. Um, but it, I, I do think it's getting better. I do think the conversations we're having around mental health, the, the approach we are taking to, towards like proactive mental wellness is getting better but we're not, we're not perfect yet. There's a lot of work to be done. At the time as well, I didn't have many friends. Most of my friends had left me for various reasons. A lot of them have difficulty handling my symptoms, especially paranoia. Um, I just got diagnosed with depression and I had to take pills for them and 
and um, it's actually been working for me. And I think that there's a stigma around um, taking medication for depression and anxiety. And I don't think there should be because people have to do what's good for them. And you have to, and the University of Toronto is not gonna just give you everything. You have to kind of go out there and get help for yourself, no matter what it takes. I didn't think that I would still be here. Even after the first attempt, I had a feeling that I would end up doing it again or again. Maybe someday in the future, if things, if things get bad again, maybe it'll happen again. I didn't think that I could get that bad. When resources are available to students and they don't feel comfortable or they won't come forward to take them, I think there are two elements that play a role there. The first is like external, like how they're going to be perceived by others. You know, there is still a stigma on accepting help, which is unfortunate because it's like you're supposed to do everything yourself, you know, you're not supposed to, especially with regard to mental health, like sometimes admitting that you can't do things, that literally there's a barrier in your brain that stops you from doing certain things and that you need to get help towards. Um, Sometimes, sometimes admitting that, people look down on you or think you're weak, and I, at least there's that perception. I would say that if a student or if a friend of mine is struggling with their mental health, um, I would tell them that it's no different than getting a cold. It just means you need to take, you know, take the necessary steps to, to you know, deal with it. Um, to, to, you know, take care of yourself the way you need to. I decided to go to seek help, which took me three years to go to health and wellness to say, I need help. I'm done with them. I'm done with the University of Toronto. Um, after they made it so hard for me to find mental health resources on campus, and reach out to anyone, like, I'm done. Like, it's great that, um, I know that yoga and mindfulness and meditation can help me, but I'd also like to, to know if um, there's something seriously wrong with my brain. accessibility services before. What I find it particularly helpful is, is for um, like class notes especially because I have, a I have a difficult time attending class usually. So being able to catch up on the notes instead of having to awkwardly ask anyone, it's really helpful. It, it alleviates a lot of anxiety. It's, it's not the same. Like there's the, the joy of being at school has disappeared because being on campus just fills me with dread because they couldn't do anything for me when I needed it the most. So ideally, a student who wants to seek some help, mental health supports will come through our family practice unit or our primary care area. They'll meet with a nurse and they'll meet with a doctor. Should they require more specialized care, they will be referred to SAME. Um, but in the meantime, they have the nurse and the doctor who they can connect with. Um, and with my friends, I think that I kind of distanced them, and that was that was all me, and um, that was no one else's fault. The trouble we run into is a lot of individuals have um, sort of this understanding that the best way to get care is individually, and in some cases that's true, not all cases, and uh, certainly having built out our group programming, the feedback we're getting from students is it's wonderfully refreshing to be in a group learning skills and realizing that they're not the only person who's having some of these struggles. It's like talking to a brick wall, like sometimes you just want to talk to someone who will understand a support group or something. Things like that aren't really offered here. At least at University of Toronto Scarborough, we're one of the fastest growing campuses in Canada. And that, which also means we're pumping out alumni as like 
faster than almost any other campus at, in Canada. So many of those alumni really have the potential to come back to the university and really help students out, give them a bit of perspective and really problem solving. And I found that that's how I personally um, learn to cope with my own anxieties and my own, um, you know, distressing moments is when I reached out to UT alumni. And there, were, there was no systematic way for me to access UT alumni. I think having a support group here would be such a great addition and it would be able to help so many people struggling with mental health issues. I think they're doing what they think needs to be done to help students with mental illness, but what they think we need and what we need can often be two different things. So it's interesting to have these, all these different perspectives of people who've gone through what you've done, but also have a bit of distance from the university to be able to offer you that perspective. For me, I see the gap between the visibility of alumni giving back to the university. When you walk around campus, you see these boundless posters, these um, promoting the, the Boundless campaign. Yet, as a student, there's very limited opportunities for us to actually engage with alumni. There needs to be more options. There needs to be a, a variety of different ways that people can get help. At, at the University of Toronto, um, forming a community takes a lot of effort on the student's part. Um, joining a community takes quite a bit of effort on the student's part. For example, uh, in my first um, year or two at university, I didn't really feel like I had a community to rely on. I was just like coming in for classes and going back and like doing the activities that I did. Um, so it was, it is a bit of a challenge, I would say. But then, the, then there are, um, you know, roles like mine that are here to support those students who, who want to find that community, who want to find their niche. And there are definitely a lot of amazing pockets of communities that we have on campus, just that accessing them might be the issue. When I did speak out, people really became aware of the issues related to mental health and mental illness. And I got questions from people who would come up to me at receptions or so, and they'd look both ways and then they'd say, I've never said a word about this to anybody, but, and then they'd tell me their story about mental illness. I was asked to do a number of speeches, and uh, uh, it was really a door waiting to be opened. People wanted to talk about mental health. To guarantee that, there's a connection for every student who might be experiencing something to do with mental health. You got to have those resources that are tailored to different people's experiences. And part of that involves just talking to people and finding out what they're going through and then finding something that complements that. So when it comes to mental health, when it comes to our international students, when it comes to our students, we're really talking about a university community and university community response. And so one of the things I really want to stress is it's not, it, the unit, Center of International Experience has an important role in responding to mental health and helping our international students navigate and negotiate mental health. But at the same time, I really think it's important that the university community addresses this and that um, all persons feel empowered to tackle the issues, some of the stigma around mental health. And so I encourage international students that are champions and are leaders in our communities to engage in these conversations with all their different places of community. I think we've done a great job with our group programming development because we've been able to introduce in a systematized way evidence-based treatments to actually address certain um, diagnoses. Talk about your mental health. If you had a problem because you broke your leg and people come and they want to talk to you about your broken leg. And just the experience of being able to listen to other students and how they've dealt with their own. A lot of them have experience um, mental health related struggles on their campus as well and actually have have led their own initiatives on campus so it's affirming to know that University of Toronto um, is not the only institution that is also um, sharing a lot of these experiences too. What we were able to pull together, and it was an involvement of students, staff, and faculty, so it wasn't just students and people out of health and wellness, but professors, um, was a, a document called Our Mental Health Framework, which positions 22 recommendations. Um, the biggest recommendation is that we need to really look at what the culture is like on the university environment and be a kinder, gentler, 
perhaps more supportive um, environment for students who are here at the university. I really wanted to make sense you know, of what was happening both at the individual, at the institutional, and even at the national level, and maybe even the global level too, as to why, why so many university students, and college students even, also like go through their own struggles. People are becoming more accepting in terms of just like student life and discourse and stuff like that on mental health, um, which is great. Um, like I've seen a lot of resources on like anxiety and depression, there are focus groups and things like that, and that's wonderful. And hopefully that expands beyond those two disorders to like encompass more mental health disorders as well, because I know a lot of people don't fit into those two categories. Whether they're getting better or worse is their own personal trajectory. It has nothing necessarily to do with the institutional resources that they have at their disposal. From as a student, um, I I was I didn't take up a lot of these like student union type roles until like very late into my university career. But I do believe that the administration the administration could be doing more to ensure that students feel connected. Students feel like they have access to the resources that they need to succeed. Um, there are definitely a lot of things available to us, but there can always be more. Um, there are a lot of students who keep falling through the cracks, whose needs are not met until like it's too late. Um, uh, for example, a, a very close friend of mine um, had to drop out of university and, and like went through a suicide attempt because they were all of these things were building up, but there was no help provided until it was too late. I would love to move away from being a reactive service, from being able and having to provide emergency on-call services, to providing a lot of secondary psychiatric services, to uh, a place where we're promoting healthy activities, where we're giving students the skills and tools that they need to not have to end up in our services and end up needing to see somebody for something a bit more intense, that had we got there in the first week or two, could have given them something or could have directed them to them to a program that would help them not um, have a situation that's become bigger than, than we need it to become. Even something like adding, like hiring another few accessibility advisors, it would be great because then it would speed up the process, a lot more people would be getting the help that they need. There's some very good work going on uh, at the University of Toronto to try to identify the importance of physical health with mental health. The two go together and there's some work going on in the Faculty of Kinesiology in identifying uh, what, um, what those linkages are. So for someone who is uh, suffering from mental health issues, I would say to them, don't go and, uh, uh, and sit in your room with the, uh, the curtains drawn go and get some exercise. Uh, maybe you need to go to the gym and get rid of some of that pent up angst that you're having. So there's, it, it's not simply about healthcare, it's about the whole person, it's about the whole experience. I did not have access to the gym. And when I was on my co-op term, and as you know, um, as, or as you may not know, exercise is really critical and for overall well-being and immensely, immensely helpful for also coping with, you know, um, overall mental health as well. And so it, it seems so bizarre that you pay $500, $600 for the first eight months that you're enrolled as a co-op student. So you're paying over $4,000. And I wasn't willing to pay for, because I'm saving up, right, as a student. I'm saving up, I don't want to pay extra for, going to the gym. It's expensive and when I mean, you're working as a student from nine to five. So what I did was that uh, when I, I used to work at the Toronto Star building at One Young Street. And so what I did was that I recruited uh, my coworkers so that we would walk up and down the Toronto Star building every week. That's how I got my exercise. <laughs> I'm Nanashka D'Souza. I'm asking you, Merrick Gertler, the president of the University of Toronto, are you going to do anything about the mental health crisis on campus? I, Zara, am asking you, Merrick Gertler, the president of the University of Toronto, what are you doing to reduce the stigma of mental illness on this campus? I 
think we also need to focus on feel like wellness and and um, making sure you you are like well rested and relaxed and and you are taking care of yourself, uh, which is a huge component of of where on the ladder you are with your mental health. Uh, it's not a conscious decision really to be saying mental wellness, but I do think that mental wellness is extremely important. Um, and um, and um, just as important as like making sure that we are providing enough support to mental health needs. I think that uh, there's some very exciting things going on in the field of research into various forms of mental illness. Uh, depression studies, just the, the Cameron Wilson chair, is, uh, there's some good advances there. I guess I like to think that I've been able to help many students over the years, uh, but the ones that uh, come to mind are those that have sought me out on more than one occasion, listened to the advice, and uh, came back more than once uh, to check in, how's it going, what else? What other advice do you have for me? After that year, I dropped my um, psychology major and I decided to pursue something that I actually enjoyed. So I went for film studies. Uh, and um, after that, it, it got slightly better because I was doing something that I actually enjoyed, not like psychology where I was competing with everyone else because that's what it felt like. To me personally, I think success is doing everything that you need to do for yourself, as well as passing that forward to other people. So balancing the fact that you need to take care of yourself with the contributions that you make. I fully am a believer in social responsibility, where you have to be responsible for your own actions as well as uh, what you do for other people. But sometimes uh, you can't do that without taking care of yourself first. I would say that although I don't know what they're going through, everyone's gone through something and there's definitely a way out. Um, like there's definitely someone out there who can help you and someone who can relate to your position. So people who don't feel like they have anyone to talk to, chances are people will be more understanding than you think. Yeah, we have a lot of ideas and plans on how to approach mental wellness on campus. Um, for example, one thing that I'm personally going to be um, trying to do is hold a lot of regular events for students to come out and meet other students and come out with their friends and so on. Just a place to like grab a bite and have a chat. And you know what I mean? Because we, we lack, we seem to lack uh, a lot of these spaces on campus where, where students can just socialize and get to know each other and they feel like they belong to a part of the community. Unless, unless they're doing, doing that through a club or through a cultural society or through a college and so on. Um, so one of my ideas is to, is to create a space free of, of any sort of affiliation where you can just you know, talk and, and relax and play board games or something. And that is a huge component in my opinion of, of like good mental wellness, just having a place to relax. Um, other than that, we are looking to work with a lot of service groups like uh, the Students for Very Free Access to destigmatize a lot of uh, the issues around mental health and, and as well as disability and uh, be kind of have like audits and reports and assess like what the university could be doing better to help students with their accessibility needs and such. I just want, I think students need to know it's okay to ask for help, that we've spent a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of uh, sort of networking connectedness to uh, make sure that people know what resources are available to them and don't be afraid to ask for help because that's what we're here for. Um, so, what, and so what we do at Minds Matter is that we're actually developing a resource navigator. I'm really proud of my team for this. Um, what it does is that it's written by students. So any student who could see, it's written in the language of students because these are students who've experienced these the lobby struggles. For example, like, I don't feel safe on campus. So they press this button and it leads them to all the resources, all these websites. I want them to acknowledge that there are students who are suffering from depression and anxiety and I want them to make their services more obvious and more available because <laughs> because 
because it's great that you have an education and all and that you're boasted as one of the world's top universities, but what good is that when your students are suffering? I found talking with professors, certain ones, to be the most helpful. I think they're doing a lot, but there's always more that could be done. I don't think I regret any of the experiences that I've had. It's difficult, of course. It's really excruciating having all of these experiences, trying so many ways to figure out what helps. But at the end of the day, the person I am today is a result of all of those things, all of those experiences, those illnesses that I've dealt with, and they make me a stronger person. And I think about how in the future, if I have kids and they're going through things like this, if they tell me that they have suicidal thoughts, I know what to do. Like, I'll be able to be there for them and not just be afraid or just think that sending them to a hospital is the right thing to do. I found myself at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, where I spent quality time finding myself and finding the true purpose of living and the true purpose of being in school. And with my amazing support system from Health and Wellness, Accessibility Services, the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program at the University of Toronto, I've been able to be in this journey. There are days that are down and the days that are up. And I'm proud to say, I'm happy that through this journey, I've learned resiliency. I've learned to be kind, to be compassionate, to enter into suffering of other people, which is empathy, and that's my success story. I don't need to get A's in class to be successful. All I need, it, all I need right now is to be kind, to be compassionate, to have a sense of empathy to other people. And living with chronic depression taught me that. And I think that's my success story right now. And I'm proud to be able to share that with my friends, with my family, with people close to me. And I hope everybody can get to have that in their life. So to anyone struggling, I would just say, don't wait, take actions into your own hands. Do what you can to make every day more bearable. Take a break from school if you have to. Find something you love. Find some meaning, something that puts meaning into your life. There's so many ways that you can work on yourself. Find happiness again. Even when it seems impossible, it's within reach. And then in a few months, you'll look back and can't believe that you made so much progress. But where I'm at right now is much better than where I was at a few months ago. And I like to think that in the next month, the ones after that, I'll be even better. So, I want everybody who is watching this film to talk about mental illness the same way as they talk about they have the flu, they have uh, a, uh, a broken leg. It has to become more of a way of life that we can talk about something because one in five people suffer from a mental illness at any one time. So you're not alone if you're suffering from a mental illness.